privilege of introducing today uh, Lawrence Douglas, the James J. Grossfeld Professor of Law, Jurisprudence, and Social Thought here at Amherst. Douglas holds degrees from Brown University, Columbia University, and Yale Law School. He is the author of five books, including The Memory of Judgment, Making Law and History in the Trials of the Holocaust, a widely acclaimed study of war crime trials, and The Catastrophist, a novel that received the Silver Prize in 2007 in the category of general fiction from the Independent Publishers Association. A recipient of an NEH senior fellowship, Douglas has many publications, including the Yale Law Journal, the Washington Post, Harper's, and the New Yorker, and he is a regular contributor to the Times Literary Supplement. Today, he will read from his recent novel, The Vices, which made the best of 2011 lists of New York Magazine and the New Statesman, and was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award in 2011. Um, after the program, there are books for sale in the lobby, um, and um, Professor Douglas will be signing books if you're interested. And so then, without further ado, I introduce Professor Douglas. Yeah. Um, th thanks all for uh, coming out. Hope you're having a nice reunion. Um, the idea of a good long reading is something of, in my mind, of an oxymoron. So uh, I'm going to try to keep this reading from the vices relatively short, and then I'd be happy to uh, answer questions about the novel, about life on Amherst these days, about Biddy Martin, any kind of questions you feel like answer, uh, asking, I'll be happy to answer. Um, I also thought that maybe I would start off uh, actually just reading from the very beginning of the novel. And by starting with the beginning of the novel, that relieves me of the need to kind of give you a lot of backstory about the no what the novel's about. So I think the best way to kind of get into the book is just kind of hear how it starts. So I'm going to start with the beginning of the novel. Then I'll give you a little bit of an excerpt from a, uh, the second chapter. So here's how uh, The Vices begins. On July 18th, 2000 and blank, at 1800 GMT, the Queen Mary II left Southampton with 2,012 passengers and roughly half as many crew. She arrived at the Brooklyn dockyards on the morning of July 14th with 2,911 passengers. In a brief wire service piece, the New York Times identified the missing passenger as Oliver Weiss, 41 professor of philosophy at Harkness College in Western Massachusetts. He was also my closest friend and remains so even after he brought ruin to my marriage. Officials for Kennard, owner and operator of the QM2, prepared a meticulous account of Oliver's last hours. On the night of July 22nd, the QM2 passed 17 nautical miles north of the point where, 90 years earlier, the Titanic had struck an iceberg. That placed her 150 miles south of Tilt Cove in Newfoundland, heading southwest at 22 knots. The evening's entertainment included a screening in questionable taste of the movie Titanic in the Queen's Room and a performance of Hamlet Condensed in the Royal Court Theater on Deck 3. But apparently Oliver wasn't in the mood for either. He arrived promptly for the 2030 seating in the Britannia dining room, joined by his mother, wearing the sapphire necklace that her second husband had purchased in Zurich. The crossing was meant to celebrate her 70th birthday, which technically wouldn't fall until mid-August. Oliver wore tux. I knew the outfit well. I was with him when he purchased it in London's German Street several years before. According to his mother, he was a bit withdrawn, but that was hardly news given their strained relations. She was suffering a withering atmospheric headache as a result of the storm. Shortly after dessert and a cigarette in the chart room bar, one of two enclosed areas that permitted smoking, Francesca retired to her Deck 12 suite, which had a connecting door to Oliver's room. Oliver stayed in the chart room. Receipts show he had a second gimlet, then crossed level three to the casino, where he purchased $200 worth of chips and took a seat at a low-stakes blackjack table. 
He played off and on for two hours, ordering a third gimlet. At 0.45, he cashed out with 280, that is with winnings of $80, a tidy gain. Oliver always was a sensible gambler. He made a point to avoid unnecessary risk. His next destination was the G32 nightclub, named for the QM2 shipyard hull number on deck two. There, he met a German woman traveling with her brother, a 36-year-old journalist confined to a recumbent wheelchair with late-stage ALS. The brother and sister, accompanied by his round-the-clock nurse, had boarded in Hamburg, the QM2's original point of embarkation. Half the passengers on the crossing were German. Oliver and the Germans converse, uh, conversed in a mix of languages, English, German, French, and listened to a Caribbean band, St. Lucia, playing covers of popular reggae and soul classics. Oliver and the German woman briefly danced together. As the threesome prepared to leave G32, Oliver handed the astonished lead singer of St. Lucia his $80 of blackjack winnings as a tip. Certainly an impulsive gesture, but a sign of a man shedding all worldly possessions? Not to my mind. If he was already planning a plunge, why keep the $200 in his pocket? The brother's nurse, who also was suffering from a headache, had been let off early, so Oliver helped the German woman wheel her brother back to the stateroom on deck nine. With the brother safely returned to his medical suite, the woman invited Oliver for a drink in the terrace bar, but he declined. It was now around 2.45, or rather, 1.45, taking into account the one-hour turnback scheduled every night as the time zones were crossed between England and New York. Oliver rode the elevator, or took the stairs, to Deck 13, where he watched four British teenagers play ping-pong by the pavilion pool. The three girls and one boy were surprised by the unexpected appearance of a single man in tuxedo in the otherwise empty pavilion. The boy, 16, responded to my email as follows. Right, I remember him. He stood there watching us for a time. We thought at first he was drunk, but he didn't look wobbly. He simply watched us, no smile or anything, definitely a bit odd. Without a word or gesture, Oliver then exited through the exterior door to the boardwalk. The force of the wind from the deck blew the ping pong ball right off the table. The game resumed only after the mysterious man had disappeared and managed, against the wind, to force the door shut. A CCTV camera, one of 19 that kept the ship under continuous but not complete surveillance, captured an image of Oliver on the aft deck of level 13, holding fast to the guardrail, looking out to sea. The time was recorded at 2.32. In the grainy stutter of the CCTV, which I watch and rewatch on my laptop, Oliver can be seen, back to viewer, walking toward the ship's stern. He never reached the area covered by the next camera, only 20 yards away. Oliver and his mother usually had breakfast together. His failure to answer her knock didn't immediately alarm her. Twice on the crossing, he'd risen early to perambulate the quarter mile deck. It was only a half hour later when Francesca opened the unlocked door connecting their rooms and noticed his bed hadn't been slept in that she contacted the QM2's security office. The officer on call initially resisted issuing a shipwide missing person announcement. Experience had taught him that it was not unusual for singles to spend nights in cabins other than their own, and it was still early. Francesca, however, demanded to speak directly to the ship's chief security officer, who reluctantly commenced the full search procedure, a time-consuming combing of the entire ship. On a typical six-day crossing, the QM2 conducts perhaps two full vessel searches. The missing person is usually located, inebriated, or in an otherwise compromised state within an hour of the first announcement. But after an extensive search and an examination of the CCTV tapes, Oliver was officially listed as presumed overboard at 12.43 on July 23rd. 
passengers swimming in the terrace pool, reading in deck chairs, or jogging on the promenade might have noticed three U.S. naval helicopters scrambled from Pinchgut Point in Newfoundland, passing starboard of the ship en route toward the area where the navigators had calculated the missing person would have entered the water. Briefly designated a search and rescue operation, this was changed at 1,600 hours to search and recovery. Oliver's body was never found. Francesca always insisted it was an accident and a preventable one at that. At the memorial service conducted in the Harkness Club in Manhattan, she was dry-eyed but distraught, obscurely repeating, Ali, 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 always so stubborn. She sat flanked by her lawyer, who had already prepared a wrongful death complaint against Kennard, and by Bartholomew, Oliver's gargantuan fraternal twin, who surveyed the funeral and accepted condolences with the lethargic detachment of the clinically depressed. Depression explained Bartholomew's absence from the trip, and also, I suppose, his failure to eulogize his brother. I'd intended to speak at the service. In fact, I'd stayed up the better part of the night preparing my eulogy, but in the end deferred to Oliver's colleagues in the philosophy department, a decision I'll always regret. Three professors made brief statements. The president of Harkness spoke of Oliver's philosophical accomplishments and political courage, of his well-publicized run-in with President Clinton at Oxford, and of his opposition to CIA recruitment on campus. But none of the eulogists showed any deeper appreciation or understanding of Oliver the man. They ignored his suffering when they should have extolled it. They described a thinker whose gifts would have propelled him to the forefront of contemporary analytic philosophy, but their tone told of a wunderkind who, after an early splash, had drifted into premature irrelevance. They moved no one to tears, except maybe Oliver's widows, five in all, <laughs> drawn from various spots on the globe, spread about the handsome wood-paneled club room and sobbing from beginning to end. There was Jean Summer, the so-called soulmate, grief-stricken grief and jet-lagged after a flight from London, Anna Strindberg, the stunning six-foot great-granddaughter of the Swedish misogynist and playwright, Mary Guan, the Korean-born museum curator, Carolyn Dworkin, the 20-something bookstore clerk who clutched a volume of Blake's poetry, and a still younger woman I didn't recognize. Over the widows hovered the spirit of Sophia Baum, whose tragic death a decade before preordained, or so went the tidy story that I never accepted, Oliver's own. The widows cried openly, but not in competition, I doubt they knew fully of each other. Like members of a terrorist cell, each lover had a knowledge limited to one degree of separation, <laughs> a blinkered picture of Oliver's complex romantic enta entanglements. They shed tears in memory of their love for the deceased and of the futility of their relationship with him. So this was uh, the, um, so the beginning chapter. And the, the beginning chapter is a little bit, um, as you hear, it's a little bit discursive. It's kind of just uh, almost like a repertorial uh, repeating of um, the circumstances of Oliver's disappearance. Um, and much of the, the uh, novel tells the story of our first person narrator. The first person narrator, actually, we never actually learn his name. But the first person narrator um, is very taken with what has happened to his friend. And in order to try to figure out why Oliver's life ended the way it uh, did, he ends up engaging in a rather um, elaborate examination, not simply of Oliver's life, but also of the life of Oliver's family. And so he gets drawn into a whole story about Oliver's family. And, um, and I guess the general trajectory of the novel is that at the same time that the narrator is learning that Oliver and Oliver's family is not all that he thought it to be, we as the readers are kind of simultaneously learning that the narrator is not all who we thought him to be as well. Um, so I'll give you just a very short um, little flashback uh, from when Oliver and uh, the narrator first meet. Uh, this is the first lunch that they shared. Um, and this is when the uh, novel uh, begins as a um, 
kind of jumps back in time to when, uh, again, this first meeting between Oliver and the narrator. When I first moved to Harkness, the dead mall was a huge cinder block carcass of deceased retail space. At the time, its sole tenant was Panda Garden, a Chinese restaurant that showed scant signs of life when I pulled up before its tattered awning a few minutes past noon on a bright spring day. By the entrance stood Oliver Weiss, arms folded, a worn canvas rucksack slung over his shoulder. I expected him to say that the restaurant had died. Instead, he opened, he nodded by way of greeting and held the door open for me. Inside, a lone waiter was flogging a tabletop with a towel. His face brightened when he saw us. Good day, Vice, he exclaimed. Regular table? The waiter escorted us to a dark, undesirable booth by the flapping doors to the kitchen. I surveyed the menu while the philosopher gazed at an oversized fish tank in the middle of the restaurant that lacked both fish and water. <laughs> Frankly, the invitation had surprised me. During our first meeting, they had met very briefly, the two, Vice had appeared to take no interest in my existence, and I hadn't exactly found warmth in his. And yet, out of the blue, he called a week later, inviting me to lunch. Do you recommend anything, I asked? Not really. The food isn't particularly good. <laughs> and that's why you come here all the time? He didn't exactly smile, but his eyes from behind black, heavy frame glasses, the kind a newscaster in the 60s might have worn, registered a quiver of amusement. When Wittgenstein lived in Dublin working on what became philosophical investigations, Weiss said, he dined every night in Bewley's Cafe on Grafton Street. He told the waiter, I don't care what you serve me as long as it's always the same thing. <laughs> anyway, the owner, that's him over there, he uses an abacus. That alone makes it worth it. <laughs> At the bar sat an elderly Chinese man with a comb over, watching TV without the sound. Anyway, the steamed vegetable dumplings are plausible. If you'd like, we could split two dishes, though I don't eat meat. Sometimes I make an exception for fish, preferably one high in omega-3s. This got us talking briefly about his vegetarianism. His voice, flat until that moment, jumped with animation. This was something I would come to know well, his pleasure in describing his childhood, the one unconditionally happy period in his life. I used to adore the taste of meat. My mother always shopped at Yorkville Meat, a Hungarian butcher shop on First Avenue, and she would take me along so I could breathe the odor of uncooked meat and organs. I loved watching the butcher slice Black Forest ham and hard garlic salami on the cutting wheel, how the threads of fat would separate and the meat would fall into a neat stack. When other children fantasized about becoming archaeologists or veterinarians or deep sea divers, I longed to become a butcher. I wanted to chop meat and slice it and wrap it, and most of all, I wanted to eat it. My very favorite dish was steak tartare. This was pronounced with a mild affectation, which my mother used to prepare only twice a year at Christmas and again at Easter. In high school, I became a vegetarian. I haven't had meat in a dozen years, but I still often dream about it. When the food arrived, conversation faltered. The windows of the restaurant were open to the mild spring breeze wafting across the weedy tarmac that once had been the dead mall's parking lot. Still, sweat beaded on Oliver's upper lip. He was less de dexterous with chopsticks than I might have expected. A cold sore glistened on the corner of his mouth. He must have noticed me glancing at it. Herpes, he said, adding simplex. And then, this is the end of that, uh, just jumping a little bit forward, this is the end of that lunch. Um, he insisted on picking up the check. He cracked open his fortune cookie and read, a great romance waits you. Waits, he repeated, bemused. He rolled the fortune into a tight coil and pocketed it. Evidently, he kept a collection of malapropisms and solecisms. The cookie he didn't touch. In silence, we walked to our cars on the weedy tarmac. Well, thanks for the lunch, I said. Next time, it's my treat. He offered no response. But as he unlocked his car, he said, almost under his breath, have you ever fallen in love with someone you're not attracted to? Then he climbed in and drove off. Over the years, I've often thought about that line. 
More than once, it crossed my mind that he might have been talking about me. <laughs> but even after I met and came to know Jean, the comment's intended subject, I never understood the emotional weight of Oliver's words. I could imagine being attracted to someone without being in love, and I could also understand falling in love with someone you might not consider fundamentally, that you might consider fundamentally unattractive as a person, someone selfish or lacking a generosity of spirit. I could also, of course, understand falling in love with a person you don't originally find attractive, but falling in love with someone you're not attracted to, it didn't make sense to me. I never doubted, though, that it made sense to Oliver. As we came to be the closest of friends, I often would chastise myself for failing to understand his suffering, for lacking the imaginative depth to make sense of his pain. In his memoir, Montauk, Max Frisch offers a lovely description of a friend's suffering. His was always exemplary, mine only personal. So it was with Oliver. Perhaps it was the connection to the melancholies of the philosophical spirit, to the generational woes of middle Europeans, to the peculiar afflictions of fallen aristocrats, but Oliver's suffering had volume and depth. It was large, relevant, and ramifying, not merely suburban, Jewish, and neurotic. I knew the latter world intimately. I came from it, had written a novel about it, and would never fully escape its orbit. The former, the old world of titled wealth, doomed romance, and congenital sorrow, was largely unknown. It was the world whose heavy, ornate doors Oliver would open for me, and I would enter gratefully. At the time, I felt simply flattered by the overture the young philosopher had extended at our first lunch in the Dead Mall. The fact that almost everyone at Harkness found him aloof, if not arrogant. The fact that he'd shown so little interest in me at our first meeting only strengthened my curious sense of election. His words may have been cryptic, but they signaled an unexpected and welcome desire to reach out, a willingness to expose private feelings. Unsure whether I wanted to be his friend, I was glad that he appeared to want to be mine. So I think I'll stop there and uh, be happy to, again, answer any questions about uh, the novel. I also, um, I, I don't know how much of this was publicized. I am deputized to speak on behalf of, this, of the uh, Swedish um, writer, uh, Lars Arfsen. So if anyone has uh, additional questions about this uh, Lars Arfsen, I am deputized to speak um, on his behalf. Um, so um, any, any questions? Yes? Yeah, I've never written a novel. Uh, I probably never, in fact, I certainly will never write a novel. Yeah. <laughs> I would be very interested in you know, getting some sense of what the process is like. Yeah. Um, I've been a, a pretty passionate reader of fiction for many, many years. Um, I can kind of really date that to sixth grade. In sixth grade, I started keeping a list of all the novels I'd read and, and basically kept that embarrassingly, kept that list to, to today. And, um, um, and, um, and at some point, I really did have a kind of feeling of like, I think I can sort of do this. And I've kind of read a lot of them. And, um, and so at some point, you just kind of sit down and do it, I suppose. Now, one thing I did try to do is I tried to kind of block out certain ideas in advance. I mean, at least I don't know how other novelists write. I mean, at least writing The Vices, I think what I had is I had, I've always kept a lot of journals with ideas. And then I think for the novel, I don't think things were particularly well plotted out. But I think I knew where point A was. I think I knew where point maybe E was. And maybe where point M was. And, and then trying to kind of, as I was writing, I sort of figured out how to move from one of those points to the other. And, um, and I just basically said, I'll write a thousand words a day. Wow. And which is not, you know, I write a thousand words a day. It's, and after a while, you're, you know, in, a, in 90 days or so, you're done with the first draft. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you're done with the first draft, I should say. And I really do try to do the thousand words a day. M my wife's here, and she calls it the barf out draft. And, and I very strongly believe in that. I mean, I do have friends who are writers who, um, 
edit and polish as they go along, which strikes me as a crazy thing to do because you're gonna end up throwing out all this sort of beautifully polished prose. And so I really just try to um, get the first draft out and, um, and then I think the, the real process starts in, in the editing. And the editing, I again, I find it a, a pleasurable process because then it's, it's almost like the old, I guess the technology no longer exists of developing photographs um, since everything is digital now, but it's really almost like seeing the, the image finally turn crisp and clear and, and, and satisfying, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, if I understood right, the narrator was Jewish, but I'm not sure about Oliver. The name Weiss suggests it, it might be, but on the other hand, you mentioned that the mother made certain dishes at Christmas and Easter, so I'm confused about that. Well, again, I don't want to be coy or cagey or anything like that, but your confusion is welcome. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I guarantee that by page 326, all your confusions will be very satisfactorily resolved. Um, Could you indicate how? I, I, actually, I, again, I don't think, the book is not in any ways kind of a conventional mystery. I mean, I think of it as a piece of literary fiction, but um, I, I would say that there are kind of complexities about Oliver's family history that perhaps even Oliver is not even uh, aware about. But it's, it's not as if the, uh, I don't think what we, I think it's fair to say that the novel is not um, headed towards some simple payoff of, oh, Oliver learns that he's Jewish. That's what the novel, I mean, it, it doesn't head in any kind of simple payoff, but there are kind of these complexities about identity and family that play a very big role in it. And there is also, I don't want to also kind of reduce the, the, the novel to kind of a simple um, irony, but um, as you get into it a little bit more, Oliver is a, a philosopher of identity. That's what he, his, his uh, his academic work is on. And I suppose there is a little bit of this irony associated with a philosopher of identity who doesn't really have a particularly clear sense of who he is. So, yeah. Does, I mean, I've heard authors speak that the character really tells them what's gonna happen. Does that happen with your Oliver? In this book? Does he become something that you are listening to rather than you writing? Yeah, there, there's an interesting, Yes, um, and in, in this particular case, I mean, I don't want to, um, the, the character Oliver is based, not exclusively, but in, in certain parts on, on someone who's a, a very close friend of mine. And which creates both, um, I think, opportunities and constraints. I mean, I have a very clear vision in my eye, in my head of who this guy is, though sometimes there are a couple of characters in here that I invented entirely. And there, there's also kind of liberation that comes with having these characters that, um, <coughs> The, that are entirely created. Given the fact that Oliver was based on someone I knew, there, were, there was a, um, there's a wonderful letter that um, Ernest Hemingway wrote to, to um, F. Scott Fitzgerald after F. Scott Fitzgerald sent him a copy of um, Tender as the Night. And a couple in Tender of the Night was based on this couple that Hemingway and Fitzgerald knew very, very intimately. And Fitzgerald had changed certain things about that couple in the novel. And Hemingway wrote this wonderful letter to Fitzgerald saying, sorry, I can't say I'm more enthusiastic about the novel, but you changed all these things. What are you doing? You're writing fiction. You just can't go changing things about people. And, and there was that kind of, there was something sort of wonderful about this, this idea that um, even though you are doing fiction, there are these constraints that are placed upon the, the um, the, the writer. And some of those constraint, constraints can come from the real world, but I think, as you also suggest, they come from the imaginative process as well. That at some point, the characters start saying, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, but I was really hoping you would. And they're like, no. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. And that definitely does happen. That, you know, yeah. By way of disclaimer, I'm a fraternity brother of your father-in-law. So oh, I say? And I'm very okay. sorry he's not here. It's, as am I. Yeah. I believe you wrote a book, and you said at the beginning you'd ask, answer anything, about yeah. the Nuremberg Trials. Yes, that's Could right. you give us a brief overview of that, you know, a couple minutes, because I want to read it eventually. Um, well, that was a book that I had um, in, in kind of the, um, I guess I sort of wear two hats. One is this kind of fiction writing hat, and the other is this, uh, the academic hat, and the academic hat that I wear is, I've, I've written a lot about um, 
international war crimes trials. And um, the book that I wrote um, about Nuremberg was about Nuremberg and it was about a, uh, several other uh, trials involving um, prosecutions of perpetrators of Nazi atrocities. It was Nuremberg, the first Nuremberg trial, the Eichmann trial, the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, the trial of Klaus Barbie. Uh, so I think there were five trials in total that I wrote about. And um, in writing about those cases, it wasn't supposed to be just a narrow um, jurisprudential argument. It was really kind of looking at trials as ways of teaching history. Uh, one of the things I thought was very interesting, if you look at the statements that were made by prosecutors of those trials, all the prosecutors get up before the court and say, I'm not simply concerned about convicting the people in the dock. I'm concerned about telling the world about these atrocities that were committed. And in as much as all the prosecutors thought of themselves as performing this pedagogic, instructive function, uh, I was interested in asking how good are trials at doing that? How good are they at teaching history? What is the kind of image of history that emerges from these trials? And that's what my book was about. It was really looking at the way uh, history becomes uh, represented through uh, these important trials. And ultimately, I think, uh, as opposed to a lot of other people who said trials don't do a particularly good job, I think my argument was a little bit more um, nuanced. I think some trials did a really good job, some trials not such a good job. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Yes. Yeah. The opening passage passages sounded a little as though the narrator never does find out the missing fact. Now, so, do you promise that this is not a shack? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I promise it's not a shaggy yeah. dog. I promise it's not a shaggy dog. At the at the same time that, um, if one is kind of looking for perhaps the uh, the kind of resolution one finds in in a detective fiction, um, again, this book doesn't deliver that type of simple resolution. But nor is it. Um, Shaggy Dog in that uh, what we have here is just a, a kind of postmodern proliferation of uncertainty. So that um, you know, by the end of the novel, uh, we don't know anything for certain. <laughs> that, that's also not what's happening here. So, yeah. Okay, I'll read half of it. Yes? I've been told that uh, Rather difficult, if not impossible, to get a manuscript into the hands of an editor at a publishing house. Um, and I guess the trick probably is to get the right uh, agent. But can you remark on that? I don't know how yes. this happens. I worked for a publisher, but in a very different category. And uh, the kind of stuff we did was had to do with education, so there was a channel there. A demand, very specific. But how does this, if you can answer this without hurting anybody's feelings, <laughs> how does this get from a lawyer, I mean, I mean not a lawyer, yeah. from a, uh, well, a would-be <laughs> lawyer, <laughs> sorry, <Yeah. laughs> the Freudian slip, right. but anyway, the, the uh, what's the trick? Yeah. How do you do it? No, it's a, it's a very good question. It is a, um, I think particularly the market for literary fiction in the United States today, it's very small. It's very hard to get a literary fiction published. Um, I've had some strange experience. I think you're right, you have to have a good agent. Um, I was sort of fortunate to have an agent that was able to kind of get, but a, a lot of it is, um, a lot of it really is fortuitous and you have to get lucky. And I mean, I can tell you two funny um, agent stories and publishing stories if you want to, do you want to hear these? Sure. These yes. quick, do we have? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, so two these. <laughs> one story was about getting an agent, um, and I've actually been with a couple of agents. But one of them was, um, uh, I think it's actually in front. I had worked um, with a colleague of mine. Uh, we had written a number of um, uh, short humor pieces. This uh, guy Alexander George in the philosophy department. We had written a lot of uh, short humor pieces over the years, and we liked the idea of trying to like pull these short humor pieces together and get them published. So we sent them. We pulled these pieces together. We sent them to an agent. The agent said, sorry, I'm not interested. I don't really think this is the making of a book. I'm glad you published them individually, but good luck. And, um, and then we basically kind of um, 
did nothing with the manuscript for about a year. You know, we were happy. We'd publish the pieces individually. We thought, oh, well. And then about a year later, we decided, um, I don't know why we decided to do this. But anyway, I wrote a letter back to this guy and said, you know, we took your advice about how to reorder the book. And um, so here's the manuscript. We've added a little bit more material. We uh, re reordered it exactly in lines with your recommendation. And here it is again. And two weeks later, he's like, love it. Glad that you. I'm, I'm just completely serious. And it prob probably about two weeks later, it was sold to Simon and Schuster. And, um, and actually, one of the only reasons I think that worked out was because he had, in, in the meantime, hired some guy who was a real specialist in humor. And he, was, uh, he had clients like The Onion was his client. And, some, and uh, so he actually knew editors to approach. And so it was just kind of um, fortuitous. Then there was a, uh, another What's story. What? What's the name of that book? It's called Sense and Nonsensibility. Okay. Price to Move on the <laughs> Desk Outside. Um, and, uh, and I have mentioned that the proceeds for the sales of the no novels do go for the Milo and Jacob Douglas Amherst College Funds, our little boys who otherwise will be. Um, but, um, and the, the other story, the other story that I'll mention was, um, uh, this is when I was trying to get the, the Catastrophist published. Um, this was the first novel that I wrote that came out in 2006. And, um, and this agent had obviously sent out uh, my novel, uh, my manuscript, with another manuscript. He just sent them out simultaneously. And, uh, and both my novel and this other manuscript that the agent sent out uh, were both rejected by this, um, this press. I don't remember, it might have been Doubleday. Uh, but typically, you get a letter from the editor explaining um, the reasons for the rejection. And um, so I read the letter, and I saw the editor's response, both reaction both to my manuscript and to this other manuscript. And about mine, it said some uh, nice things, but ultimately was passing on it. About the other manuscript, it was really quite savage what the editor said. <laughs> uh, really, it was like, I, I don't see you know, why you're even sending this thing out. <laughs> and two years later, that other manuscript won the Man Booker Prize, <laughs> which, yeah, the leading book prize in Britain, that manuscript won, a book called uh, Vernon God Little by uh, DBC Pierre. So it really is very, it's really quite arbitrary, these uh, <laughs> things. You don't like to think of it as that way, but yeah. See is the relationship between your two professions, um, if any. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess the the one thing I do, the one thing that unites is that I've always loved writing. So, um, so, um, and I'll base yeah. So I, th I think that's the the connection is you know I certainly t uh, take pleasure of doing the academic writing and I like doing the fiction writing as well. I don't like going back and forth between them uh, when I have to do it like, ra like I like to single task instead of multitask. I find it stressful going back and forth between them quickly. But other than that, I, yeah. To, to, what, to what degree do they inform each other? I mean, well, I think one thing that, that certainly, um, well, I don't want to say I make things up in my academic writing. <laughs> that I don't want to <laughs> say. Um, but something I have felt very powerfully is, um, and this is not in any way to cast aspersions on people, uh, of colleagues at Amherst, or quite to the contrary, but I think if you read a lot of scholarship, a lot of scholarship I think is very poorly written. Yeah. And it indulges in a lot of jargon. And I've always taken very seriously the idea that I'm writing for a general audience. And if someone is an interested, committed reader, he or she should be able to take pleasure in what I'm writing. And so I think that's, the, that's where that, that commitment to writing expresses itself in the, in the scholarly writing. I, I absolutely I find it really intolerable that when scholarly writing becomes very, very insular and jargony. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if you teach writing, do you? You know, I'm this fall I'm doing a fiction writing course. Okay, well, yeah. the, my feeling would be that since it's so difficult to get books published, wouldn't you find it easier and nicer to be able to 
teach kids how to write nice poetry and short stories and nonfiction rather than have the great weight of what if they were to try to get the book published and then they couldn't. Yeah, well, I, actually, the course that I'm doing is a, is a short story course. So it is a short story course. Uh, though, of course, getting short stories published is no easy thing in the United States these days either. I mean, there are many, many very small journals. But I guess the question is, you know, what, what, is, what, what is a student trying to do with his or her writing? Um, I would think that, um, and I've asked myself, you know, what I hope to teach students when I'm teaching them something like fiction uh, writing. And I think that, uh, and it goes back a little bit to the answer to your question, which is, I think if people become better writers, that carries over in expository prose, it carries over in all areas. And I think one of the most important things one learns from fiction writing, and you can learn it obviously in expository writing as well, but at least in, in a fiction workshop, is you learn to read yourself. You learn how to read your own work. And I think uh, one thing I try to tell all Amherst students, Amherst students come these days with very, very different degrees of preparation. Some students come very well prepared to take advantage of the curriculum, and, many, and some students come very ill prepared uh, to take advantage of the curriculum. And I usually try to tell them that no matter how prepared they are, we have failed them as teachers if they don't leave this place much better writers than they entered. And part of becoming a better writer is not simply having a professor change your sentences, but teaching you to read your sentences to make them better. And so I think that's one of the things I really try to teach the students is how to read their own work so that they can recognize how to make a sentence a tighter, better thing. Well, our, our son, our older son, both our boys went to Amherst. Our older son graduated in the class of uh, 1974. And he yes. won the poetry prize that year. Yeah. Yeah. But there, and continued to write poetry. Mm -hmm. But there was a satisfaction for him in what he was able to talk about. For instance, he died of lymphoma three years ago. Oh, sorry, Some of his that. poetry was just sharing that right. and, and having the satisfaction of being able to tell people. And it's in the library. Right. Well, that's, no. that's yeah, that's very good. Yes. As an author, do you have strong feelings about the emergence of e-books? Um, I mean, I, I, the, um, the question of e-books is an interesting one. I mean, my basic feeling is I mean, one of the things is, you know, I'm a professor, so I kind of, I obviously have a sinecure, so it's not like I'm trying to make a lot of money off uh, the writing. So, and I think it's almost, in the United States, very difficult to do that. Um, my, I guess my feeling is anything that makes books more readily available is a good thing. Um, and um, so the e-books, I, I, I guess I find it, if people, if it actually contributes to an expansion of reading, uh, then I think that's a, a great thing. And I'm not as concerned about driving down the cost of um, that of the, co the the kind of monies that uh, authors make from their work. Obviously, one thing that is a concern is what's going to happen to um, publishers and the whole future of the publishing business and. Um, you know, I don't have any answers to that. My experience with publishers that I've now published with a bunch of different houses, some of them very big and well-known, others of them smaller, is that publishers just don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 I really do find that. I mean, they just seem to have no model for what they're doing. And they really do bewilder me, publishers. Um, they, um, I mean, they, yeah. I, I don't know what to say. So, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to see a more vibrant book culture in the United States. I'm not particularly um, optimistic that we will become a more literate culture. I guess the kind of thing is what um, can sort of break the slide of books into total irrelevance. And uh, if ebooks can sort of break that slide, great. And um, if they accelerate it, not so. Not so great. Yeah. yeah. How long have you been teaching here? I've been teaching, I'm almost at the, t at the, 
point where I start lying about how long, because, 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 because it shocks me to say how long. I've, so I now just refer to a year instead of the total number of years. I've, so I started in 1990. Yeah, I would say the college has, um, well certainly, I mean something you probably read a lot about or heard a lot about is the diversity of the student body. Um, you certainly see that. You certainly see a much more diverse student body since I've um, been here. Um, besides that, you know, I've heard some professors say that they think the students are stronger or weaker. I haven't really noticed much difference in the quality of the students. One thing, um, which I will say, um, which I'm sure will get me in trouble then with everyone in the administration, is I do think sometimes there's a, a kind of bimodality in the student body nowadays, which I didn't notice when I first came here. And oh, by bi I'm sorry. bimodal, and by my bimodal. Bi okay, by yeah. bimodal, I mean that you know a grading chart might have looked more like a bell curve at one point, and now it almost looks like that. <laughs> there's some exceptionally strong students. And then there are students that are not strong. And it's not, it just has to do, I think, with um, the nature of the preparation that they receive. And it, in some degrees, I think we have the responsibility to, if we accept students, we have responsibility to bring them up to speed so they can take advantage of our curriculum. And I think we're still in the process of figuring out ways to do that. I don't think we've solved that problem yet. Is there a pattern in terms of those students are a weakness and any characteristics that? Um, I, generally, they, they're, they're, you know, I don't think there's any kind of, I wouldn't say there's an ethnic uh, pattern, I wouldn't say there's an athletic pattern, I wouldn't say, I would say there's a pattern in terms of the quality of the schooling they received in, um, in high school. I mean, I think that's the clearest pattern that I've noticed. It really goes to the quality of the high school's preparation. Yeah. Um, a very large number of students from throughout the country, or is it, large, uh, let's say, a bigger proportion from the Northeast? Well, we have certainly increased the uh, geographic distribution of the college. Though it's always been quite wide. I mean, another big difference, though, is not just that we have a um, greater ge geographic distribution within the United States. One very substantial difference is uh, we have a much larger presence of international students. Um, I think we now have about 8% of the college's international students. And some of those international students are so terrifyingly talented, it's, it's sort of, it's a little terrifying. I mean, it's, <laughs> I am, um, yeah. Some very, very, very talented. I, I, I can tell stories about some of these international students too. It's sort of like, you kind of feel bad for the Americans in the class a little bit. It's like, no, you're, you're still special. Don't worry about, about that. Um, yeah. But I think that's one of the biggest, the, the international students. And I think that's a wonderful uh, addition to the college, the um, bringing more international students. Yeah. Yeah, hi. The, uh, I graduated in 77, and I think our class had about 325. Uh, students that year. The school's gotten a lot bigger since then. Is that having any deleterious effects that you've seen, or is there any problems or anything like that, or do you think you don't even notice? I, I honestly haven't noticed. I mean, I, I guess the incoming class is around 450 now. I mean, I think the average size of the class, I think so the student body is about 1,800 or so. And um, I think it, um, you know, it will need, you know, I, I I, I, you know, anecdotally, I've heard that there are longer lines to get into Valentine's, so, but, which is, no, but I mean, there are things that can be irritating to students, you know, if there are, if a college is designed to have a student body of 1,600, and suddenly you have 1,800, then it does put a strain on, on resources, but I don't notice it in, in classrooms, particularly. Because academically, I've spoken to some undergraduates, and they said, geez, you know, I have trouble getting into some courses that I want to get into, and when I was here, that, that really wasn't an issue at all. I mean, you could just sign up and you're into whatever you want to. And now they say, oh, geez, you got to sign up earlier. You can't get into the courses here. Is that really an exaggeration? Or, uh... I, I don't think that's an exaggeration, but honestly, I mean, I, I'll confess, I mean, there are a lot of courses that I have limited enrollment and I don't let the students in. Now, I, I don't want to like pat myself on the back and say that it's because I'm a popular, but I think it does, you know, I think there is, if you're teaching a seminar with, and the seminar has a cap at 15, 
and you have 35 students trying to get into the seminar, you're going to have to turn other students away. But um, I think the faculty-student ratio still more or less is 10 to 1. And so the average size of a classroom is still going to be 20 if you do, you know. So that, that hasn't really changed. And I guess some classes, it's a little bit of, you know, students might rush to certain classes, but I, th I think it's not a, a, a problem across the board. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, yes? So you mentioned a little bit about the fact that you model one of the central character devices on a good friend. It's obviously not an accident. It was a good friend. Previous good friend. Right, right. It, it takes place in, at, a, at a college that you seem to have invented in Western Mass. It's obviously not an accident. Right. So I, get, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about sort of how much you feel like either autobiographical things or things that you're familiar with in your own life come into the work and what kind of challenges, I mean, you, you mentioned a little bit, but I mean, I gotta believe that there are colleagues who recognize themselves sometimes in a character in a novel, uh, those kinds of things. Yeah, it's, that is a, it's an interesting question. I mean, one thing is just, um, you know, how people recognize themselves in, um, in books, which is always a, so it's kind of a fraught issue, I suppose. It's always, it always surprises me the things that people take exception to, which you can't necessarily anticipate. And there also can be things like, I mean, for example, I, you know, I, I remember less so with the vice, but I remember with the catastrophists, uh, there were a couple characters that people thought they recognized, and they, they were just wrong. Uh, I mean, and, 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 uh, um, and, uh, and so, you know, and, but you tell them they're wrong, and they're like, you're a novelist, you're lying. Of course it was that person. It's like, it really is not that person. Then you have the kind of the reverse phenomenon. You have something like, I remember, um, I once gave my brother uh, a story of mine uh, that had been published, and I saw that uh, in the margins he had written, like, big exclamation points, this didn't happen. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a story, so why, why, why should it have happened? Um, and then, and then there are people who do, you know, do think they recognize themselves and can get a little prickly about it. Um, but again, sometimes it's very hard to anticipate the things that people will get prickly about. But this very close friend of mine wrote a, um, a novel, a terrific book, uh, about um, his, uh, basically his childhood. And uh, he wrote some really, really difficult things about his father and about the father's uh, philandering, the father's actual... Um, sexual like impotence and things you know things that I wouldn't really like to and then I remember that uh, his uh, my friend's stepmother uh, the father's uh, wife then came up to him to my friend and said you know there's one thing your father is very upset about he never went prematurely gray <laughs> and um, so Legal yeah. issues that come up that you can talk about? No, I mean, there's not. Uh, the one legal issue, I mean, this is again, um, I don't know if we have to break, but uh, I can talk about legal issues involving th this book. Is, uh, I mean, for some, some of you might not know this, this is a parody that I wrote under pseudonym of these uh, Stig Larson trilogy. And uh, because it was a, a parody, um, that was something that um, really had to comply with copyright law. And copyright law carves out this exception called fair use for parody. But in order for something to be a parody, it really has to be parodying the original. It can't be that close to the original. So um, I found some very, very odd things that, uh, I mean, one, I'll, I'll give, just give you one uh, funny example of something of uh, trying to uh, comply with the copyright laws. Um, so if you're familiar with the Stig Larsson trilogy, you know it takes place in Sweden. And, um, and so I'm kind of parrying this thing, and I thought, well, what do Americans know about Sweden? They know about IKEA. So there's this kind of fictional, there, there's a, a fictional um, company here called Ukea instead of IKEA. It's fine. <laughs> Ukea. I mean, not supposed to be fun, but. And, um, and there's a CEO of Ukea. And the CEO of Ukea, um, trying to be faithful to Stig Larsson's imagination, I had to make him a, um, obviously, a shadow Nazi. 
So the head of Yukia is a shadow Nazi. So I thought that was sort of pretty fun. And then the, um, the lawyer for St. Martin's Press who did this book comes back and goes, well, you know, of course, that the founder of Ikea was a Nazi sympathizer. <laughs> and so we're now concerned about, um, yeah. And um, so I do have to make little changes with things like that. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, yes? When you were in sixth grade, yeah, so what were some of your biggest influences, like classic and contemporary? Um, let's see, of like uh, writers, I guess people have read a lot of. Um, let's see, who do I? The writer that I um, I've been rereading a lot of is uh, Nabokov. So I think Nabokov is. Oh, with Jeremy Irons reading oh, Lolita? What? Amazing. I mean, if you ever listen to, I don't know if you do a lot of books on tape, but um, Jeremy Irons reading Lolita, it's terrific. Really, really terrific. And, um, and just about everything. Um, I mean, there are things about Nabokov I don't love, but I really do kind of feel that whatever literary genius means, like, that's it. Um, and... Um, I guess history, I, I love Flaubert. I went through a bad Faulkner phase for at one point, though I think I got over that. At some, um, I was reading, what did I read recently? I read a couple of novels by Richard Ford recently, um, who just came out with a new book called Canada, which I haven't read, but um, I think it's supposed to be good. There's a wonderful Hungarian writer named Dezo Castellano, and I just read a novel of his called Skylark which I think is fantastic, um, early 20th century novel. Um, and I think it's pretty Catholic reading. I mean, Catholic isn't like general, like kind of all over the place. Um, but, um, but the one that I seem to come back to a lot is um, the Bakov. The other one, actually just to go on at length, is for the Vices, because the Vices was a first person narrative, but telling the story of another person where the first person isn't really playing a huge role. The book that really stuck out in my mind was The Great Gatsby, which really, which really kind of strikes me as the best example of a successful novel that uses the first person to tell the story of, a, of another person. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, uh, these days, do you think Amherst is a, uh, a, a nurturing environment for the creative arts, both for faculty and for students? Yeah, that's actually, a, that's an excellent question. Um, Didn't used to be. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I, I have a great answer to that. Um, I often, there have been times at, uh, at Amherst um, in the past where I felt that, um, that the college is a very welcoming place to people of all sorts of um, backgrounds, all sorts of ethnicities, all sorts of... Um, doesn't matter if you're conservative or liberal or if you're, but I've sometimes felt that creative students struggle a little bit here. Hmm. Um, I have felt that at times, that um, because I often find that creative students, uh, I often find that Amherst students are exceptionally well-rounded students. They do everything very, very impressively well. And it strikes me that creative students are often little misfits and you know they do one thing really really well, but they they can't really walk up the stairs that, you know. <laughs> and and Amherst I think is I, I I do, I think that's actually a very very good question because I'm not sure that Amherst really does supply a, a terrific environment for that kind of students because there is a sort of a kind of Amherst student and that kind of Amherst student tends to be just an exceptionally well-rounded student. Very critical. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yes, one final question, and we're... As a yeah. nation, we're not teaching anybody to write nowadays, not necessarily the novels, but just sure. writing in general. Would you agree with that, and how do we solve it if you do agree with that? Well, one thing that we've tried to do at the college is, you know, we do have this uh, first-year seminar, yeah. and the first-year seminar program we changed a few years ago to really make it a writing, a ten, you know, really an intensive writing experience. Um, I teach a first year seminar, the students do 10 papers over the course of the semester, 
and during the 10 papers, I mean, they really have to, I mean, we go over sentence, 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 sentence. So, and I think a lot of, and I don't think it can be uh, isolated to a single course, but I think the college has recognized the need to, um, to identify writing as one of the key competencies that every student has to come out with and that it is a four-year project to develop that kind of competence and it has to start with a very clear and emphatic statement in semester one and so it does with the well, first year seminar. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, we all knew how to write when we got out of there. Yeah, yeah. No, I think there really is a commitment to that. Here's the, here's the English one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll be signing up. Uh, thank you very much.